cakes. Some oat cakes. Okay. Oh, <laughs> well, oat cakes are great. Oh, the oat cake, man. That's, that's, that's historic, isn't it? Oh, yeah, well, they're fine. Yeah, I like them. Yeah, love me oat cakes. Very nice. Scrumptious and the pie plates, not forgetting them, but make sure they've got the currants in. <laughs> That's another original from this, from our area. There's not many people in the parties that don't eat them. Oh, it's the best. I just had one, literally walking down the road, had one before I got to you. I mean, they don't get oat cakes anywhere else, really. <laughs> Red and oat cakes. Well known for oat cakes, yes. I take them down to Northampton. To I just don't think it goes outside Stoke on Trent, really, does it? If it did, I think it'd become famous. If you open a oat cake shop somewhere in the south of England, they do a bomb, I think, personally speaking. I don't believe that. Somebody must outside the statue eat a whole cake. National? What, you mean like Japan and that? I haven't had a pizza for this. Bummy. We have bacon, cheese, and tomato, but uh, I eat the bacon and cheese and just dip the whole cake in the tomato juice. It's very lovely. Cheese. Everything's cheesy in this life. <laughs> the more cheese on them and the, and the bacon, the better. <laughs> Sausage and cheese, black pepper, a little bit of Tommy sauce, bang it. Oh, I've got to have bacon, sausage, and tomato. To oh, tomato? Yes, tomato. What I tend to do is, as a breakfast, is to get a banana and roll the banana up in an oat cake. Just to... so, well, they are, they are very nice, though. They look like, yeah. yes, yes, they are. Yeah. It's ambrosia, it's food of the gods, along with lobby and bass and jowls. If you're going to have an oat cake, you've got to go to an oat cake shop. Yeah. You can't just buy one from Tesco. No, the better like at the oat cake shops when you're making the salves. If you want to come to Stoke, make sure you grab one, because if you don't, you're missing out. That's the donation. Right, there's a few different theories. There's one that there wasn't many other crops around but oats, um, and the farmers were, were making them themselves on, on top of the, the, the sort of gas stoves they got at home. And another one is that uh, the soldiers had seen a, a Japatis over in India, and uh, they sort of come back and try to replicate it, and got it all wrong and ended up with the oatcake, sort of colonial sort of times, yeah. That's another theory. I don't know which one go with myself. It yeah. is strong, I mean it's not obviously what it used to be. There used to be oat cake shops in the middle of, of every three or four streets in a lot of places, you know, there'd be an oat cake shop. Um, there was, there was, I believe there were hundreds. I think we're down to about 30 now, but I, I think the ones here are gonna remain at least. You know, I don't think it's something that's gonna die out, certainly not in this county. Christmas is amazing. We have to do double shifts at Christmas, like because we're shut for a week. It's like the wheels go in because they can't go oat cakes. <laughs> Stoke on Trent people are really lovely. They really are. They, they kind, considerate. You know what I mean? If they don't like you, they don't speak to you, but they'll give every newcomer a chance. <laughs> we can slag it. Nobody else can. <laughs> It's like your family. You can pick on your family, but nobody else can. Well, the same with Stoke, I suppose. This area is actually called Foley. Um, there's actually a brook that runs through a culvert under the main road just before the bridge, which is called Foley Brook. And this area from the railway bridge right the way down to the first roundabout is actually called Foley. Contrary to popular belief, because most people call me Mr. Foley, and 
that's not the case. Baxton is a corruption of the word Bakestone, and, and that's basically what we're doing now. We don't light fires anymore. Ours, ours is heated by gas jets underneath. Lots of them. You see the machine coming down now, which contains the oat cake mix, and it will deposit three oat cakes at a time, move slightly closer to us, and deposit another three. And that will go on and deposit 60 oat cakes. And Craig will be chasing along behind it soon, turning them all over. Everybody's got their own recipes. Everybody likes their oat cake shops. Obviously, they've been brought up on it. So I was uh, a lot thinner than a lot of other shops. And some are really fatty. So you just get the taste of what you enjoy, don't you? I was employed as a property buyer and I used to wander around Stoke on Trent buying as many derelict or semi derelict terrace properties as I could. And one of my favourite places I worked was in Middleport, where we bought several hundred houses and modernised them, moved young families into the area. Unfortunately, that's now over and done with, and, and Middleport has been demolished, um, which is very sad because the community will never ever come back again, you know. And I'm a bit of a traditionalist, and hence my involvement with the oat cake, I think. And I would hate to see the oat cake disappear. I personally don't think it will do, but a lot of other industries have disappeared, and uh, I just hope the oat cake isn't the next one locally. But as long as we've got potters, I think we still have oat cakes. The Prince's Regeneration Trust, who are one of Prince Charles' charities, of course, fundraised 8.7 million to be able to purchase the site and to do the work to it. So it's still the natural home of Burley. They've been here since 1888. They now lease 50% back, but the charities say own the site and are restoring it for the future. The whole point of this is for it to be all things to all people. Um, you know, we've got the visitor attraction, but that also means that we've got lovely rooms that when they're not being used for things like that will be used for community. There isn't a really a community centre around here. We can have those kind of events and things here that give people a bit of a nucleus. Um, new properties are being built around here at the moment as well. You know, it, it can't get any worse, frankly, around here. So it's, uh, it's definitely improving all the time, little by little. I think all the, the manufacturers that are doing well, um, and Pearly's not the only one by any means, and we're next door to Steelite, fantastic, huge company, great local employer. 
it, it's all just positive things happening in lots of different places, and it does bring pride. You know, the likes of Emma Bridgewater, people like that. It, it's you know, the industry isn't dead; it is actually still ticking over in some areas and, and really improving in others. It's nice because I know the company's getting grown. It's nice to know, it really is. And people have kept the jobs, and that's all we want. And to we want people around here still on trend to get back into employment. And I think the Princess, Princess Trust has done a lot for that, a great lot. And I think it will go on for better things. I mean, you've only got to look around you to see how things are changing. And I think people will start taking a pride in the area that they live. Unfortunately, we've never had the resources or the manufacturing skills in the area because they've all been taken away from us. But now things are going back to the way they were. So that's good. I've always worked in the pots. Always. Um, I did about six years where I stayed at home because I had a daughter. And then before that, I think I did a couple of years working in a shop because the pot, the pottery industry was just declining. Uh, but since it's all come back up, I'm loving it. Back again and I'm loving it. So if it carries on. It's a lot easier to create jobs than to create communities. Um, and the community in Middleport was absolutely decimated. I mean, half of it was flattened. So whether you can quite recreate those kind of halcyon days, I, I really don't know. But there is very much the hope that the project here will act as a catalyst to improve the wider area. You know, having more jobs here, having tourists coming here, that's all positive news. That all brings a reason for people to live here and work here. And hopefully, over time, communities will grow again. <laughs> If you're producing food for, for the public, you've got to wear all appropriate protective clothing, uh, hats, um, um, you know, footwear which is health and safety standard. Doc Martins, uh, these are steel toe capped uh, Doc Martins and the good thing about these is they're, they're not slippy uh, on on wet floors and stuff, and they, they're very hard wearing. But I used to be in the army, actually. Yeah, I, I did. I was in the army for a while. But uh, yeah, no, no, they, 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 you know, they're a very, very good product. When I was in, when I was in the army, if I was off at weekend, I'd be working, working in the blink, blinking bakery. Uh, yeah, so uh, I've never stopped working here, really. Yeah. I did once get a McDonald's actually inquire once, um, but uh, it never came off. I think we couldn't agree upon a price. And then the thing is, they'd want so so many. The volume would, would have been so big for such a short period of time, uh, which probably would have put us under pressure. And also, I think another factor in that was, I think probably even bigger factor was. Uh, the short shelf life 
they they have different offers on McDonald's, don't they? And and yeah, you know, thinking back now, I think it was the sh the shelf life which actually put them off. I've always always drawn uh, and sketched since I was a child. Uh, strangely enough, when I was a child in the early forties, um, we were a working class family, and to buy paper to draw on was was never a possibility. Our money was needed for other things. So I love books. I also loved the blank pages that you used to find at the back of books and on the front of books. So every book that I ever had during that period had got no pages in there. I tore them out and used them to draw. And sometimes when I, we'd visit a family, uh, they'd ask me, oh, would you do a little sketch of Joey for me? And they'd give me a thrams for it and this type of thing. So I've always enjoyed drawing. In later years, of course, working, trying to earn a living and feed a family, the painting took a back seat, and I only did it as a hobby occasionally. Um, until, again, in later years, when I found myself redundant, I found that I needed to, to do something to earn a living. Uh, I was still only 60 at the time, so I still had a few years left, and so I took up the painting again, and by fate, by fortune, by good luck, I ended up here at the gallery, and local people seemed to like my pictures. It seemed to remind them of their childhood and their memories. And so we sold a few, and, and that's what I try to do now. I wouldn't want to go back to those days, but the memories of those days with me and other people in the, the area uh, don't s signify that. that. They love the nostalgia of that era. And I think it's probably because of the people were different. The, the people in our street, we knew them all. We never locked the door, we didn't have to, because we had nothing to pinch and nobody else did either. Um, ordinary people weren't relatives, we called Auntie Lily, Uncle Jack. We knew them that well. And so that's my memory of, of childhood growing up. And it's what I'm trying to get down on paper, in pictures, uh, before I curl my toes up. I'd like to get as many of these memories down as I can that other people can perhaps enjoy. Last train leaving Brunswick Wharf along the Biddle Valley Way Rode on by the platform on old Fool's Day 68 Once before a carry metal coal and straw Passengers and cattle to an evening runs of war and my dad was thinking, what, what can he do? He was, uh, you know, do we do a chip shop or something like that? But then he brought these up kicks over and goes, right, kids, what do you think of this? And then we said, yeah, they're all right. He um, rescued this old machinery from uh, out of this guy's garage. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. Steve, Alex's dad, was the best boss I've ever, ever had. Uh, I've got his picture at home, he's a superb man, he was unfortunately died and uh, his lad's young and helping him all the way. He's a good guy, Alex is. Oak cakes are down in the books that they're not platinum, and they're not, they're healthy. Depends what you put on them. There was something once, I went to shop and this girl says to me, Oh, Darren says, I'm, uh, I'm really glad to see you, I want to, we used to do filled oak cakes, already filled from the microwave room. I've been dying to see you, I've been dying for an oak cake. I said, hey, Donny, I thought you were on a diet. I am, I am, but oat cakes aren't fattening. Have you got a cheese and sausage one? <laughs> <laughs> Just made me laugh. <laughs> I'm on a diet, but I want a cheese and sausage oat cake. I like to think I've got, I've got 15 staff, uh, you know, uh, 12 of which have got mortgages, you know, I've got to look after them, you know, I'll put them first and, you know, Hopefully I'd like to take on more staff in the future and, and grow the business and you know people look for uh, you know a leader and someone who they can trust in the community that they can go to for help and support and you know to, to help get their voices heard and get the problems sorted. I'd never give up a business, I'd just like to keep my foot through the door and, and keeping Povey's Oatcakes in the heart of the community for other people. Oh, wait.
Street for Royal Dalton in the Nile Street side. I did uh, 14 years on the shop floor polishing and then went into the lodge security for the last 10. Uh, and that, that was my working life. I left school at 16, went straight to Dalton's. And, uh, and then from that to that, 40, 24 years of not doing anything to having to start work. So uh, it wasn't. No, that's, that'd be a cool one. I'd still be there if the company was still going. I was uh, my go work, go go home kind of person. And then this just it was there the right time or wrong time. Originally it was a, a guy who set the trail up, he had an oak cake shop in uh, Basel, uh, surname Mobson, uh, and he set the trail up and I was made redundant. I said to him, we were in, well Julie said we were interested in when he was going to retire, we'd look at how many topping. And before I was just made redundant, he'd come to us. I was, I was made redundant in September and he, we took it on in December, January, that year. Well, for a short while. So we uh, we, we, so we worked with him. Worked he showed together. me how to go on. Show me how. Yeah, worked it together. Do the job. And then we they did a Christmas together. And, and then, then he, Mike said after, you know, I'm ready to retire now. And gave us first reviews. But uh, our surname's Jones and Oti and Jones. Mike's from Western. <laughs> When I was younger, like. Old and the yeah. hatch. <laughs> the hatch on the boats is the old, yeah. Yeah, and it's we're really traditional because we're on the canals, which is Stoke on Trent and Bain's Wall as well. This was Wedgwood, Brinley. Uh, Thomas Talpin wasn't too far away, was he? It's all like in the same area, and we don't uh, we don't seem to. The, the young people today don't seem to realise how much they did for the area, you know what I mean? With all the factories going gone, like, you know. Well, without them, we won't be doing this, would we? No. The no. modern day we. The Arsenal fans, he, somebody wanted to take £20 with it, back with them. Yeah. But because we can't do them by that quantity, we couldn't sell them like that. So he just had to make do with half a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> my dad took me Stoke, and that was it then. I was hooked on Stoke and I've been ever since. Gordon Banks, Dennis Smith, Alan Hudson, absolutely fantastic players. Mm, green, huh? Jimmy Green off, Doddy, Skills. Just goes on. Really good.
As a man of a certain age, and I'm sure you'll all uh, have some empathy with this, I spend a lot of time in the toilet. And um, in our toilet, we have all sorts of books about Stoke City FC, and it is incredible. I was looking through them this afternoon to see how many significant moments at this football club involved Eric Skeels. When Tony Waddington became manager of Stoke City Football Club, Eric Skeels was at Stoke City. When Stanley Matthews came back, Eric Skeels was at Stoke City. Eric Skeels played in that all-important game at Chelsea just before we got promoted in 1963. He played in the game against Luton Town when we got promotion. He played in the centenary game against Real Madrid. He played in Stanley's testimonial against the rest of the world. He played in the League Cup final in 1964. He was a key member of the squad throughout 1972 and 1971 with those great, great cup runs. And he even had time to score one of my very favourite goals against Wolves when we were 2-0 down with a minute to go and both he and Terry Conroy scored in the last minute. And I want to say that even now I see Eric every single home game. He doesn't look that much older and he's just as loyal and he's just as charming. One of the, the most gentle men that I've ever met. And I mean that in all senses of the word. Yeah. I'd like to say great So I'd like to celebrate a man who, as we've heard, has played over 600 games for Stoke City. And it's my great, great privilege to give this award to Eric Skeels. I enjoyed my career at Stoke City 100%. And I enjoy the supporters and the people of Stoke and Trent. Love them. Eric was a terrier of a type of player and you would think, you know, he was always on your heels and I thought, uh, having not known him personally, I thought, crikey, you, you know, some, somebody like, um, you know, the marking he did, he, he would never let you go. He was on your back all the time and he, he was a great, great player to have in your team. Well, obviously, I think that when you're the manager, it makes a, a massive difference from, from when I came here as director of football. And so 20 years there was, uh, was a big part of my career. There's no question about that. And sort of uh, when you're clubs like Port Vale, you've got to be able to do everything, really. Um, you've got to be the manager. You've got to be the chief scout. You've got to be the coach. You've got to be the chief cook and pot washer, really. And, but I enjoyed every minute of it. So and then when you come across the Great Divide, um, come to Stoke, and we were fortunate to have uh, some good times, great times really. Um, so uh, I've been very fortunate and sort of living in Stoke and Trent now I regard it as my hometown, although I, I was a Wolverhampton born boy and really loved Wolves, Stoke is, uh, is really my hometown. Everything about being at this football club was fantastic for me. The good and the bad times by the way, <laughs> there's a few bad times. Making my debut at uh, West Ham against the great players Bobby Moore, Jeff Hurst, Martin Peters, Harry Redknapp. Um, to getting into the under 23s with Alf Ramsey and then making my debut. But most of all, coming through as a, as a kid, as a schoolboy, uh, my father brought me down here and um, training with the amateur players on a Tuesday and Thursday night. And then obviously, then eventually signing on apprenticeship and the professional. Uh, when I was five or six years of age, I was back at the Boothen End with my grandfather, father and the friend of theirs. And I said to him, I'm going to run down this wing one day, Dad, and uh, eventually succeeded. Well, I think if you ask the true man, Stoke City fans, they know that I didn't want to go. And uh, I think people outside Stoke uh, were thinking, what, what the heck, why is it taking him so long to sign? The people in Stoke uh, knew why I wasn't signing, and at the end, more or less forced to sign for them. And uh, yeah, it turned out good for me there as well. But uh, at that time, massive regrets that I had to make that decision to to leave. But but like I said, it was I won't go into it, but it was forced upon me. And uh, you know, the crowd, the supporters, did show the disgust at it. And 
as much as I didn't like to see the disgust that they were doing, smashing windows, graffiti, etc., just showed me where I felt of them, they felt about me, it was lovely. I think it was Stevie Bowl that gave me my first oat cake. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I've looked at the thing and I've gone, what the hell? I said, what is this? It looks disgusting, to be fair. It's not the prettiest sight in the world. And he says, don't worry about it. So then it was a bit of cheese on it, egg. And I went, tomato, mushrooms. I went, what the hell are you giving me here? I ate it, fantastic, unbelievable. And the best ones on London Road, by the way, without being horrible. To all the okay shops in the Potches, London Road, Ace. So once I learned that, when we used to train and then we used to have competitions against Foxy and Gold, and whoever whoever was last to score I had to buy them. And we used to go to a little shop down the road and get the old case and soup and everything fantastic. Rice pies, oh dear God. Everything about the place I love, so as you can tell. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing it's probably what they got left out of the ingredients and just tried it to put it together and see what they came up with. I've had a really good time to yourself, but uh, I've got my weights here and I have a swing on my weights. You know, just to try and make myself feel a little bit better. You know. My head's a boat, can you tell the world we've lost it? The mood that I grow, the mo I know that I've lost it. Stokey, sounds a pound, loud and I'm proud. I was lost, but back around now that I'm found. This is the place most people say that it's lost hope. Boss, not an okay, you can smell that it's pot smoke. Working full time, no fucking off, the clock's broke. Single mother's left alone, her toes and it can't go. Kids are left fatherless, dads have gone ghost And the life of another gets bad as one goes Deprived city, surprise we still have pride in it Stay with it whilst alive and we'll die with it Britain's got talent, didn't like my lyrics but it We used to have um, two ladies of the night we Used to pop in an early morning when they were working port of the bank They only occasionally worked at port of the bank but Because they were kicked out from Coleridge or whatever And they come in one morning for the breakfast before they knocked off and um, then two drunk lads came in, uh, looking very uh, sheepish and whatever, you know, like so, eyeing these girls up and down, and there was a lot of banter going on. And a police car drew up. Well, so the coppers come in, so you've got two whores, two coppers, and two drunks, all trying not to be what they are. It was hysterical. I had to come out of the shop into the back because I was laughing that hard. You've got the girls pulling the skirts down, the lads standing up dead straight, and the coppers, because they were knocking off, they really weren't interested, you know, so that was, that was brilliant, that was really funny. They all had oat cakes and partied and went separate ways, you know. <laughs> Nothing was said. <laughs> yeah, good. Good fun. Northern Soul, there is, yeah, a really big Northern Soul scene and it is very enjoyable. I don't think, for me, that golden era of the Golden Torch could never be replicated. But I do have to say, certainly from the inception of the Torch, uh, it was just that fantastic time, Mary Quant, uh, Twiggy, contraception, uh, music, um, it all changed and it was a fantastic period in time and musically with bands, which the torch basically was uh, for the first five years, it was a mod club, a little bit heavy metal on the Sundays. Um, you just went with the role because it was just so good. So that's how I got involved in Tubstall, quite happily because the crowds were fantastic, but it was in the wrong place but you know once you've committed your capital um, to it you can't go back so for eight years the residents endured uh, the torch and I do say endured in the nicest possible way and they were fantastic but the last two years 
was all nighters every Saturday night, eight till eight. Well, you can't have that. So, <laughs> people come into Stoke on Trent because the promoters are good, they know what DJs to put on, they know the right DJs to put on, and that makes it so people come in to Stoke on Trent as an area. Always have, and thankfully, always will. I was the first female punk in Stoke and I was discharged manager <laughs> and uh, I got them their record deal with Clay and I got them their first tour and I'm um, still great mates with them today all these years later so there you go. But when the council tries to stop the gigs because they thought they didn't like the name Discharge, well, I think the most memorable things was me, I used to go up to Victoria Hall because there was a punk band on every week, and I'd say, who's in charge of The Clash? You, come with me. And I would make them walk from Victoria Hall in, in Hanley down to Northwood Hall, or down to Northwood where we practice, not Northwood Hall, Northwood, and make them watch and say, this is your support band tonight, and then they put them on. And that way Discharge got to play with The Ruts, they got to play with The Clash, they got to play with all kinds of bands, because I marched them, and that's what I did to Mike Stone as well. So that was the memorable gigs, really, getting to play with all those amazing bands. I mean, I got them this first tour. We did Leicester, we did Paisley, we did all these other places, and we did loads of publicity. And then it just, we got the EP out, and it just, I, you know, we sent it. John Peel played them. I remember sitting in our little crummy flat in London Road, me and Roy and all the lads, and we were sitting there, John, now I've got a band from the Stoke Hotel called Discharge. You know, because they chose the name to be deliberately offensive. Uh, and, uh, and we were all like, yeah, we couldn't believe it. Of course, in those days, we had nothing to record it on. It was just that one shot. And I just think that they just got out there and they went for it and they just got picked up. They were there at the right time and they offered something very different. And of course, all this thrash metal is very, very Discharge-esque, isn't it? You know, I mean, Metallica obviously recorded loads of their stuff, but they're such an influential band. And of course, they have got the coolest bass player in the planet. I mean. What other punk band or any band has got a guy who is so punk that he can go on in carpet slippers and a fair isle cardigan? Really, you know? I mean, Rainy, and, and then you've got Bones, the, you know, if I could play guitar like Bones, I would be out like Slash, and he's the most, you know, shy, you know, front lead guitarist in the world, I think. But yeah, they've got these great musos, they've got a great solid drummer in Dave, they've got a really good singer in, yeah, it's a good lineup, you know? <laughs> to be honest, I always thought I never knew what to make of Discharge when I first heard of them because it was just, uh, you know, it didn't sound punk or it didn't sound metal. It was just kind of like that, a bit of both, really. So it was, uh, you know, it, it was a major breakthrough, you know, and I think a lot of bands copied that all across the, you know, all across the world. The oat cakes, of course. The oat cakes was the first thing I had. First thing I had when I got off the plane was an oat cake. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a good place though. I mean, you know, I've been here six years. Everyone's made me feel really welcome. And, uh, you know, I've liked it. I really liked it so far. It's, in some ways, I think uh, it's very similar to New Jersey minus the countryside surrounding it, so <laughs> we don't have any countryside in New Jersey. It's, uh, it's a Stoke contract. No, no, the, uh, everywhere's different, thing, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere's got its own appeal. Yeah, we still find trying to find Stoke contracts. <laughs> well, it must be alright, because we're still here. ex guns Rosie guitar is Slash. I'm Slash. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've traveled so far and 
got to remember his dad and mum when they lived in Laurel Canyon in, in America. They were with the stars. The up and coming, you know, Jim Morrison, Joni Mitchell, you, you know, Eagles. They were people that were going to be big stars in the day. And they were coming in around the house and, you know, all the time, having a drink with them or eating. So he was, he was in that all the time. He was in, in meeting people like that. So that's where he gets his influence from. How he ever become to play a guitar like he does, I don't know. That's that's beyond me. Well, we didn't we didn't know about guns until um, it was in one of the Sentinels. There was a book coming out called Living in the Fast Lane, and his brother came around to show me, and he says, "Just read that." And it mentioned, and I, I was looking at him, and it mentioned our Tony. He says his his father being an artist. And I said, "That's our Tony," and then that's how we we, we knew about Slash then. When we heard about it, the brother David and his girlfriend, they got in touch with uh, the PR and saying that we were the Hudson family and if there was any chance we'd like, we'd like to come down and meet them, you know. And uh, we had the message back, he said, we'd have to speak to Slash, obviously. The message came back, yeah. And that's how we met. Met in Wembley. In fact, it was in one of the big papers, the Daily in the Sun, saying uh, Slash's family reunite. It was a big article in there, middle middle page spread. And so, uh, that, yeah, that's, we had the royal box and all. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, you, you can't go any better than that, can you? And we met him, we went, afterwards we went upstairs to meet him. And he, he, he had a shower first. And he just said, there's a fridge there. It was a massive fridge. And it was full of ale. <laughs> and he just said, help yourselves. Well, I got my brother with me, my dad. <laughs> He says, they come and see me, drink all my ale, and then say goodbye. <laughs> he has signed things saying Uncle Ian, you know. <laughs> but we, we, like I say, we call him Slash. Because um, when I said to our Tony, we've spoken to Saul, that's when we first met him, he said, don't call him Saul. So he said, his name's Slash. He said, nobody's got a real name in America. <laughs> and then, of course, we're in, in his autobiography, when they told him what uh, slash over here means, he says, yes, I know now, but there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> it's just, he's just written to me to say, for Ian, I don't know if you are going to read it or not, but it is a, it is a little racy. Anyway, I am so glad we have been able to be in contact after all these years. I love you very much, slash. Because when he left us, he was about only five, five or six. So, you know, we left with a little boy and we never saw it, he was us again until that day, until, you know, until he came over with guns. It, it, it could be a pain, because, I mean, when I was in me, I was in me teens and uh, mum would say, OK, just take him with you, you know, and I'd go, oh, come on. <laughs> you know, because I got a motor scooter then. I used to go down to the place down in Longton to get me spare parts and that. Mum would say, oh, take him with you, you know. And I said, yeah, I'm like, I've got friends, I'm meeting friends and that. I said, well, take him with you, just because he was a handful. There's no two ways about it. Boisterous, you know, uh, very, very hyperactive. But yeah, he was a lovely lad, yeah. Well, yeah, it was, it was you know, when he used to sit with you on the settee, you know, you will cuddle up to you, you know, it was lovely. Yeah, it was, it was sweet, sweet lad. Yeah, well, you got to say it, probably Oatcakes or Robbie Williams, to be fair, because Robbie Williams is one of the most world, the world's most popular superstars, and Oatcakes is just, it's natural to soak. I like it. Yeah, and everyone likes Oatcakes. Robbie Williams! <laughs> yeah, he's from Stoke. And Robbie Williams. And Robbie Williams. Hitler. Robbie oh, Williams, yeah, that's yeah. another one, yeah. We, we, we were telling you we seen the other day, sidekick, what's his name, that's Jonathan Wilkes. Jonathan Carl Wilkes, yeah. By the theatre. Oh, that was something, wasn't it? Yeah, along came Rob, and he was doing, when he was young, doing the amateur dramatics. He was in Oliver and uh, Chitty Bang Bang when he was 11. Um, Fiddler on the roof, uh, Pickwick. He did many things with the amateurs. He, he got an ability and a stage ability, and he came with me on summer seasons and watched good pros working. And uh, he told me when he was 12, 13, that when he left school, he was going to go into the entertainment business. And, of course, I know better. So I said, don't do that. It's no good for you. And Dad knows best. <laughs> Wrong. 
And everything he said to me, he got the idea that he would become an entertainer when he left school. And I thought, you've got to do your apprenticeships. You've got to, I mean, I learned my trade in the working men's clubs. And I got an act. And you know, what do you do when you leave school at 16 if you want to be an entertainer? I have no idea. But what happened with Rob was, take that came along spot on the right time. Nigel Martin Smith was putting together this boy band. If it had been the year before or the year after, he'd have missed it. He'd have done something else, I've no doubt. But he just happened to leave school at the right time, and everything he said would happen did. And he became a member of Take That, and as they say, the rest is history. So he's doing very well for himself. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, we, we, as fellas, we, you, you don't really think about being old enough to be a granddad. It suddenly creeps up on you. And a, a long time ago, the granddads, I mean, I remember my granddad, and they're, they're old people, aren't they? Well, it suddenly becomes you. <laughs> And so it's me now, and I'm very, very... You, when you become granddad, you're quite happy to be granddad. And she's lovely. She's uh, Teddy, and she's great. And anybody from Stoke gets them, don't they? My, my, my lad would have them, but he doesn't eat the things that you put inside them now, because he watches his diet. So there's nothing wrong with oatcakes. It's when you stick them full of cheese and bacon and things, and you, you dip in things. And so, but he loves them. And uh, Ida loves pikelets, and so she should. So I was away from Stoke and I was uh, best man at a wedding in Lancashire uh, about three years ago. And I've done my little bit, I've done my talk, and the guy came over to me and he said, what's it like to be the father of the most famous person from Stoke? I said, I didn't know about that. I said, what about Stanley Matthews? He said, was he from Stoke? I said, aye. He said, I thought he was from Blackpool. No, Stoke. Oh. I said, what about Arnold Bennett? Who's he? He said. I said, he's an author, and we're very, very proud of him in Stoke. He said, oh. I said, what about Reginald Mitchell? Who's he? He said. I said, he designed the Spitfire, and he's from Stoke. He said, no, without him, we wouldn't have won the war in the air in the Second World War. He said, didn't know that. I said, I. I said, what about uh, Josiah Wedgwood? Oh, ah. He said, potteries and all that, fates and like that. Ah. He said, he's from Stoke, was he? I said, I. I said, we're very proud of him. I said, and while I'm at it, the captain of the Titanic. Was he from Stoke? I said, well, he was, I. I said, it's well, I didn't know that. So he turns around and he says, George, who do you think the most famous person from Stoke is? And he went, Rory de Lapp. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no answer to that, is there? <laughs> See you later, guys. See you later. Thank you. 
you don't get any people like so contrary people and it's it's really really true like wherever you go there's just no people that are nicer uh, as well as the cakes obviously <laughs> um, yeah There's seven of us in total. We've been here for 26 years this year. Stoke on Trent's probably about 20% of our market. So it's only a very small percentage. All the rest goes all over the country. Yorkshire, Lancashire, Liverpool, Newcastle upon Tyne. We started Bristol, Cornwall, Wales, Scotland. So we're all spreading gr gradually all over the country with the similar type product to Stokey Ware. This here is a mould that's been cast this morning and it's just draining now. So the slip's been poured into the mould, which is normally that way up. And then we tip them on the side to drain out the excess slip, which then hardens. We then take the piece out of the mould, so we let that go hard, and then we actually, this is a little bit early to be taking this off. So that, we remove like that. Pull that off, and then that we allow to dry. And the next process would be fettling and sponging. So this is the slip house. The Clean Air Act was um, a necessity, but unfortunately what it did do was it made lots of factories uncompetitive and as a consequence they shut down. So a lot of potteries were lost during that period when they couldn't afford to put in a new tunnel gas kiln or oil fired kiln. So it did kill a lot of potteries off. But I think it, you know, there was no choice, we had to do it. So it's, it's progress. I think Stoke people have always had a lot to be proud of. I think the city of Stoke on Trent is a great place. I mean, for me, you know, I was Stokey born and bred, born in Burslem. And it's a place that I find difficult to leave. I think really because the people are just great people. I really believe that the Stoke on Trent people are great people. The staff we've got here are fantastic. I don't think you can get better, but I think they've had a bad deal. I think you know all the jobs have gone, all the industry's gone. A lot to you know the big people who employed all you know like Shelton Bar and the Pits, and lots of the pots have gone. But people don't realise that the pots are still thriving. It's still there, which is fantastic, you know. And and, and again is. Uh, a great compliment to the people of Stoke on Trent because we've stuck with it and there's some great Stoke people running great companies which is just fantastic and I think that the opportunities now in Stoke are here there's lots and lots of opportunities it's perfectly primed to become a great city again not just in the pottery industry but lots of other industries we need to attract lots of small diverse possibly even arts based industries that could really take the foot city forward an idea of how I could do it. You, you said you wanted to find the inner man. Well, this is something you might like. What? I think if I wear something, I'll be all right. But the whole point I'd is I'd still be, wear. you know, what's it? Naked. Naked. But I really think I can manage it if I wear something. What is it that you want to wear? Ugly Duck is a play about, I suppose, the central character. It's about a man called Dennis. He's unemployed and he's got lots of other problems which we find out through the play. Um, and uh, he answers an advertisement in the Sentinel for an artist's life model. And he arrives at the beginning of the play and the whole play is set in the artist's studio, which is actually a redundant pot bank. And she wants a regular guy to paint. And... Uh, and she wants to paint him au naturel. It's not like any other city. I was, well, I grew up in Leeds. Obviously, I was a student in Manchester, and then I 
worked in Manchester in uh, Granada Television for quite a long time, then lived in London. It's a very unusual place. It's sort of got multiple personalities. Um, and I think, that's a, I think that's a virtue, but it's often described as a problem. And I think if it's something you can't change, it can't be the problem, it has to be the solution. Well, I can understand you being cagey, you You took a, a big chance advertising all that. Suppose I did. Life model, middle-aged male, no experience required. You could have got some that. What's it? Weirdos. I'm obviously got quite an ear for accents um, and the first when I first arrived here I thought what, what are they talking like that that's weird and now I love it I think it's a great accent and it's full of character and full of complexity really and it's like lots of different voices but it's not you know you can say well it's a bit of this and a bit of that but actually no it's not it's a Stoke accent and it's completely unique and it's its own thing Drop of milk, no sugar. I like sugar, but my lady made me give up. Said at my age, I'm at risk of getting type 2 diabetes, whatever the hell that is. There's a little thing in the Sentinel, the local paper, called May and My Ladies, and it's just local dialect and I thought it was appropriate for an oak kitchen. And everybody that sees it loves it. It seems the younger ones these days, it's going away. They've got the honours and the cons, but they're only doing all of it, so to speak. There's not many that can do it like that now. Even myself, it dies off a bit when I'm speaking to chaps like yourself, because people can't really understand it. But when I go an old fella in, and I start toking it right, and they start soaking it, and we're both toking it, and that's how it goes on. In my opinion, it's got to stay as it is. We won't, we, we don't want to go that big that we've got to have big machines in that start putting them on the griddles for you and everything else. You have to change the ingredients slightly. It's the level of the oats. I'll just leave it at that. Don't want to give too much away, obviously. Um, you have to change it to go through the machines and we'd rather keep it as, as close to original as is possible. So we still mix it in a bucket and we still pour it on, well Dawn does, still pours it on the griddles, but the of it is. So if it weren't for Dawn we wouldn't be here, I'll tell you now. Let's follow in the footsteps of Jim Bennett and his kin. And leave these chartist rebels to the riots and the din. They don't make oaf cakes in Ohio, there ain't no lobby to. But if it means a better life, I'll see this venture through. So fanny well and Pankle to East Liverpool we'll go. And we'll build ourselves a future on the clay of the Ohio. Someone takes over another shop, they'll go into that shop, I'll pass their recipe on, teach them how to do it. So you got like one shop, one recipe. You think how many oat cake shops are there? And they're all different. And we use machines to keep up with demand, but our oat cakes still look like they're unfold, like traditional unfold oat cakes. You wouldn't get the shape the same constant shape all the time because you're unfold, because you never will. It depends on what mood you're in and what kind of day it is. But with a machine. Con shape's constant, but well, the shape always looks like it's unpoured. It's something that should be carried on. I mean, there's not much tradition left in the country, you know, and it, the regions have got their own their own items, and I think oat cakes are, you know, the original fast food. Well, to be honest, we've been planning it for. Uh for the last few years. I mean, obviously it's something that my dad wanted to do, uh, but took the, took the bit of bullet, as you say, and uh, you know, we thought we'll give it a go. Obviously it's all investment for job creation in Biddulph in the local area, uh, and you know, to provide the local delicacy nationwide. 
yeah, I mean, I've got 40 odd years ahead of me. Yeah, so we hope that uh, we can we can keep growing and keep expanding and creating jobs and investing in the community, and that's what it's about. Okay, as Boston's about for a Monday. I hope you enjoyed that a bit of Rihanna. Uh, so, how's your weekend been? Have you been up to much? It has been fresh as week last week here in Stoke on Trent, and we've got another one to come if you're up in Newcastle at Keel this week. I can remember the day uh, the Oatcake Day was born. Um, I was out with a couple of friends and my brother and his wife and we went for a meal and it was pancake day and we were at home having pancakes obviously we went out for a meal and um, it wasn't that busy in the restaurant we joked oh it's pancake day that's why no one's in this restaurant and um, I said to my friend um, I should come up with an oat cake day really and she said why I goes well because everyone's proud of the oat cake round here imagine what spin-offs it could have and what positivity it could bring I know uh, pancake days were a religious ceremony but this could be you know, something that people Stoke and people who used to live in Stoke could embrace and we'll go for it if I can get a bit of momentum to it you know the businesses that thrive around here are disappearing so um, especially in the last five years I think oat cakes have become something that everyone wants to you know shout from the rooftops about even more so than ever and uh, tight tight breweries uh, contacted them last year because they wanted to do an oatcake event at one of the pubs or some of the pubs and uh, we thought wouldn't it be good if they could get a beer um, and probably name it oatcake well they actually did one better than that they actually included oatcakes in a stout the captain of Titanic Edward Smith was born in Stoke-on-Trent um, and it's just a, a nod to him, really, a, a bit of recognition. Um, you know, it's one of the, the greatest ocean liners in the world, um, given all the top spec on everything, the first time it had been done, and we like to think that that's the way we brew our beer. Give it as much attention as possible with the finest ingredients to make a great taste. We thought there was nothing better than to get involved with Oatcake Day, because what says North Staffordshire better than an oatcake? Um, apart from Titanic beer. Um, so we got involved and al along the line of sitting and chatting with the guys at Oatcake Day, we came up with the idea of brewing an oatmeal stout, you know, good old fashioned recipe. We, you know, we haven't reinvented the wheel, but it was made with oatmeal and we called it Oatcake. And it was delicious. It was really smoky. Um, and personally, that's good for me. I like dark beers anyway, so it doesn't take much convincing to get me to try a stout. But it just had an edge to it that I can't even describe. It was almost a little bit um, peaty, is a word that beer connoisseurs would probably use if they were trying to tell you what it tasted like. But it was like smoky after it had gone down, almost a, a bit of a tobacco edge to it. Right, let's go whip these out, gents. I'll be back in a minute. Be, you know, 
vast population in the universe. People want real pubs. They don't want pubs with loud music, bright lighting, all the rest of it. Our pubs are all about community. You know, we're always looking for new ventures to, you know, to open our pub and, and get the message out there about community and great beer. All the beers have got a nautical name, so first class, um, things like that. We also have Iceberg, which has got obviously a very clear link to the Titanic. And um, there is actually a beer called Captain Smith's, which is a 5.2% um, good old fashioned British ale. Captain Smith was actually born in Hanley, in Stoke-on-Trent. Uh, it was his retirement voyage, basically. I mean, he, they, originally he was retired before they actually made the Titanic, and they asked him to do it as his maiden voyage, and then retired straight after that. So he actually pulled himself out of retirement to do it. So in a sense, it was only because of the maker of the ship as uh, John Smith actually got the bad reputation. Nothing to do with the captain, I don't think. But the, the beer itself goes down very, very well. The veil manager rings up the stoke manager and says, we've had, a we've had a fire at Vale. And uh, the, the, ma the manager of Stoke said, are the cups safe? He said, no, it hasn't reached the canteen yet. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I just thought it might be a rude one for a minute. We've got away with that one. <laughs> so when Tom tries this, he'll have to say it's a popular choice. I've always loved oat cakes. You know, it, I remember when I went to Rotherham and they always just say, do you have fry ups now? I say, yeah, I'll have some oat cakes on a Sunday morning and they always didn't have a clue what I was on about. So, you know, they are a local thing, but, you know, I think the people of Stoke appreciate how good oat cakes are, because um, anywhere else, nobody's ever even heard of them. You know, it's something you don't think about, you know, something so so simple, and, you know, you're looking at million pound investment things and things that help the society, and you don't t oat cakes don't even come into your head, but, like you say, they put a smile on your face, and certainly do when you're eating them anyway, so. You know, it's something that you don't really think about, and then when you when you mention it, it, oh yeah, that's something that we should be proud of, and you know, it's, these will go down well at some point. It's the first time you you go out onto the pitch in a, a veil shirt. It was you know quite a proud, one of the proudest of my career really. Um, so to be where I am now and to have done what I did last year, you know, it's. It's something I'll probably look back on in a few years with a with a bit of pride. You know, moving back to Stoke, although there was other clubs who were certainly offering a lot more money. You know, I just felt like this is this is where I wanted to be, and you know, it turned out to be the the best choice I've ever made. You know, I've always tried work hard, and you know, it's my name as a football. I, I remember telling a story about Ronaldo when I went watch Man United and. Champions League semi-final and he walked around the old pitch all game and the all of the Stratford end were booing him. You know, this was a guy that had just been voted World Player of the Year. And all he did was walk round and throw his arms in the air. You know, they went on to win 1-0 and went on to win the, the Champions League that year. But, you know, it just goes to show, even if you're the best player in the world, that if you don't put a shift in, then, then the fans don't appreciate it. And we've got a great away following. I think it speaks for itself. You know, it's one of the best away followings in, in the country, not just the league, I think, you know, the average home support to away support is one of the highest in the football league, so, you know, I think, you know, it's an hard working city, the fans demand hard work and, you know, they're, they're not scared to voice their frustrations either, um, it's hard work, it's hard work being a player, so, when you try and manage 20 odd players, um, well, my dad had done it for 20 odd years. Um, and, you know, he, he, he's gained on a bit, but, you know, he, he used to do all training and now on a Thursday night, and he got too old and too fat to, <laughs> to carry on the training. So, you know, it was something that I took part in quite a bit, and he asked me if I wanted to take over. So, 
you know, I did. I'm regretting it a bit now, but you know, if I wasn't um, if I wasn't doing it, then I'd probably, you know, be lying in bed all Sunday morning or doing something unproductive with my time. So, you know, it, it, I think it it drives me to want to achieve things, and you know, I think I think the players appreciate me being there as well. You. If, if I didn't just have him on the bench, you'd have been off 20 minutes ago. You like a f bag of sh You need to get the ball, play off the front, get it into Josh's feet and Machin's feet and get my off him. We're standing there, with, you know, it's just so sloppy, but get the ball, Mick, Cards, get on the ball, Chad, get on the ball, into Gibbo, into Dot, and play. And when I'm asking you to do that, all we're doing, when we're trying to play, we're getting the ball and then just kicking it off the pitch. You can't go in bubbles or anything on here, just get the ball down and play. Well, even with Sneed, you know, Adam Yates helps me how to play with us and um, he's just all positive, positive, positive and I'm the one, you know, we'll come in 2-0 down from a game of football or 1-0 to the bottom of the league or a poor side and he'll be like, hey, come on, that's all right, lads, keep passing now. I'm going, no, I'm not having any. No, have I, got, have I got made about six subs after ten minutes? I'd have made them, and I'm not joking, because there's that many of them just walking through the game. You can see that they're sitting in there, they've got the goal, they're sitting in there, so we've got to move the ball quick. What do we do? We start walking and dribbling on the ball. Don't go away, not too far. First of all, as a young youngster, 10, 11, I was a Port Vale supporter because my family introduced me to Port Vale. And then when I realised that Stoke City existed, uh, this again is the very uh, oh, 50s, around about that era, the early 50s, uh, I started to go down to Stoke one week and Port Vale the next week. And the, the gang that I played with and lived in our area did the same. And you could do it in those days. And it's not quite the same now. There seems to be a certain amount of bitter rivalry sometimes. So my thoughts of football are different, and I try to put them down on paper in the same way that I do the local pictures, and that is for people to remember the nostalgia. The nostalgia of walking around that corner at night in the winter, seeing the glow of the floodlights, and thinking, I want to get on that ground and get warm. And that's, that's what I do. Well, yeah, look, you know, every, every city in, in, in the country, you know, has rivalries and Stoke and Vale are no different, but, you know, we should get together. It's all about, you know, helping one another at the end of the day. And Stoke, Stoke's struggled for so many years, the area, with, with the industry, with the pottery industry. To have two clubs in the area still is a fantastic thing. And I, I, I as a Vale fan, I love seeing Stoke do well. To have Stoke in the Premiership is a good thing. He puts us on the map, you know, and I think Stoke fans probably feel the same way about Vale as well. There's so much history here, and you know, and it's good that we keep, you know, seeing the youngins here today with the Vale tops makes me proud because it's very hard to attract the young children, especially we've got Stoke in the area who have the Premiership clubs. So the fact that we are still getting Vale fans here and young Vale fans, because that's what it's about as well, bringing through the young kids. It's fantastic, and long may it continue. Well, it's, we're not friends, and I want to put that out there now. He's just got incriminating photos of me, what he says he's going to put on the internet, so I just, what can I do? Blackmail. There he is. What are you doing here? Hey. No what? idea. Nobody's invited you. No idea. Nobody's no invited idea. you. No idea. She's up everywhere. I took him to uh, the Bolton v Stoke semi-final at Wembley, and he was cheering for Stoke when no. they beat Bolton 5-0. Stoke fan, it's out it. there. Get the naughty 40 on him. We'll have a bit of that now, obviously, after the game. Thank you very much. That's mine. The creaky hinge makes the most noise. People with unhappy views will always speak louder, shout louder, be more uh, prominent than those who are just happy with the status quo. And that's just the way of the world. That's the same in every forum, including radio and everything. You know what I mean? That you'll get your serial complainers that come and 
and have a go, have a pop at something, and they'll get heard. You know, the, the happy, go lucky majority of people tend to sort of sit back and just watch it and see. Mentioned me three favourite players there. Uthi, Shawcross, and this new lad, Arnatovich. We'll have to get Arnatovich and throw cakes, me thinks. <laughs> I know Crouchy likes some delivered. Crouchy has a, a batch delivered every week to the training ground on a Thursday. So. And then you just know when an oat cake's done. There's two ways of doing an oat cake. And that is, get your HP sauce. Get the roll on. Cut it off, lovely. And then if you're using tomato sauce, classic coat cake roll. And then some tomato sauce for dipping. Kids, Mrs. HP, I want an oat cake. The first issue done on a child's typewriter. <laughs> with my big sausage fingers trying to hit the keys, it was a, uh, it was a uh, quite an accomplishment looking back on it. Do you remember the um, the Man City one at the, the, the Boxing Day? We're trying to get it done. Yeah, yeah. Three hundred copies of what we're trying to do on, on my work photocopy machine. Broke into his work. <laughs> yeah, that broke into work on the Boxing Day <laughs> to sort of get this thing done, and the co copy broke down after we'd done all the front pages. Yeah. Got no middle page. No, we got the middle pages done. No front pages. So I had to become a photocopy engineer that day. Yeah. And uh, we managed to get it done, didn't we? We did. Was, yeah, good times. The company shut down now, I think, so we're okay. Yeah, still, still going. <laughs> I, I don't work there anymore. <laughs> Cap. It's got to be brown sauce, HP style. Mmm. Oh, that's bloody gorgeous. See the yeah, dippers. See the nice. dippers. Sponges, fettlers, <laughs> and dippers. <laughs> hey, can't take them anywhere. Mmm. I'm so hungry. Mrs. HP loves the brown. <laughs> and that's what it takes when you want to be king of the oat cakes. <laughs> Gives you an idea of roughly when this picture was meant to, to be based at the time era. But uh, oat cakes are one six a dozen. A one six in old money is what? Five, seven and a half pence nowadays. <laughs> Things have changed slightly. They look as though they're actually going to the game and hopefully it has the same effect on the viewer who views the picture that they feel as though they're going to the match as well. Voila. Quite a few, quite a few scars all down the right arm. And that obviously that's due to um, veins off that back plate. When eggs flirt up, and you have to be very careful with the eggs. The yellows of the eggs sometimes get a bit of that on that back, and it will flirt sometimes. So yeah, you have to be careful. You don't get one in the eye. You know so. Yeah. But apart from that, it's just a matter of being sensible around the hot plates, you know. Well, no, I'm from Macclesfield, so oh, yeah. yeah, I'm from Macclesfield every Thursday, and I have to have an okay. Yes, I think so. We get to work from Macclesfield. Of course, he's 16 times world champion. The last two times I played him, he beat me with a fantastic game, and I just need to do well and make sure I beat him next time. He's playing with me father once a week at the. Um, Bersham Suburban Club, Bersham Central, behind the fire station in Bersham, once a week, and that's how it all started. There's nothing else to do. <laughs> what are we going to do? Go to Waterworld every week. 
it's it's just one of them things. We're a good, hard working, working class people, and that's where the roots come from. Same as Yorkshire, same as Lancashire. We're we're, we're the Midlands, and we're hard working people, and we work hard at what we want. I'm, I'm over the moon that Adrian's done well. You know, he, he was with me every day for about two and a half, three years. So him breaking through and doing well for himself is is great for me. But maybe. I think he's given me the recognition back of what I give him, but this doesn't matter, you know, it's, it's, he's done well and I'm proud of him. I'd qualified for three, I think it was three or four major TV events uh, we had on the calendar, and um, he asked me if I wanted to practice, and that's where we went from. He never sponsored me, but we just practiced you know, two or three hours a day. I just think, you know, we're a little uh, community, as I call it, uh, regardless of our places, um, and I think, you know, we dig in. I think you know you create so many, so many brilliant people from from Circle and some reason being there, we've got a lot of balls about us. But I think we're probably more headstrong than anybody else, and I really mean that. You've got the Dutch, you've got you've got obviously half the of the English um, playing at, competing at the top, top sixteen. And I think we're the most strongest minded people out of a lot of them. <laughs> it, it might be a shit all, but it's all shit all, and we love it. Love the O-Kicks. Um, because I think I've had them all my life, you know. I think uh, that's probably what's made me a uh, world champion. <laughs> <laughs> that's a Steel Edge International, based in Middleport in uh, Sir John Trent. And we supply 140 countries all over the world with products that are made in Stoke on Trent. I first started, the first pot bank I ever worked at was a place called Enoch Wedgwoods. Because I was told if you go on the pot banks, you didn't have to learn how to read and write. So that's when I first started. And if anything to do with reading and writing got near what I was doing, uh, it put a bit of pressure on me. I would leave and get another job on the pot bank. And I carried on the way I did, right up until 77, until I came here. Because when I first left school, I wanted to be a plumber. But you, and I was asked to become an apprentice, and I couldn't read and write, and I couldn't fill the forms in at Stoke on Trent College. So I decided to go on to the pottery industry, because you didn't have to read and write in them days. And I started work on the old Gloss Kill, and again, there was no worry about reading and writing, because all you did was come, do your job. But over the years of arguing with managers all the time, because they ask you to do certain things, and if it was to do with reading and writing, I would argue and bluff my way through it. And people started saying to me, uh, well, you see him, he always arguing with managers. But that was my way of hiding it. I was then asked to become a union rep because I was good at arguing with managers, that's what they told me. And uh, I said, oh, I'll have a go. And it changed my life. By coming the union rep, I realized it wasn't just me. I got to look after people. And I sat down and the bloke next to me turned around and said, what a waste of time, people can't read and write these days. And I forgot myself, boy, I'm one of them. I've got a problem with basic skills, and that then broke the ice, and then John Irwin, uh, a lecturer from the college, turned around and said, Tom, you could help people so much if you'd tell them. I then just started telling people. I thought, right, oh, so good. I'd say, I came out of the closet, you know, by saying, I can't read and write. And I, oh, you get the odd one or two, eh, pretty thick. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I can't read and write, but there's a lot of things I can do that they can't do. You know, people think you're thick because you can't read and write. Just because things don't click on basic skills doesn't mean you, you're thick. It was a Saturday morning. I got a letter. I opened it. I just didn't understand it. Because I was still struggling to read. So I said to the missus, look at this. Says it's here, why? He says, what's she say on it? I said, well, I don't know what she say. He says, 10 Downing Street. He says, it isn't, it isn't a joke. You've been put forward. I thought, me? Who's going to give, why do you want to give me something? 
it wasn't until I got told by the TUC that thousands of people had started coming forward because the bloke with the football top, shaving head and an earring, stood up and said, couldn't read and write, there was help and support, and thousands of people started coming forward. So uh, I got awarded the MBE in 2002, but really I didn't. The factory did and the workers had still out for me because they'd all helped me through everything I did. You've got to work together as a family. Um, it seems here when I started in 77, the people here seem so friendly and that's why I'm still here. They're a great set of people. Without these people here in the company, I wouldn't have got my MBE. The moral support and there's more people on here that are willing to help people and a laugh and a joke and that's what it's all about. Do your job but have a laugh and a joke. The pottery people, there's no one better than pottery people for having a laugh and a joke and being polite. Always be polite to people and we do that in the pottery industry I believe. People knock this area and the people from Stoke well, go away and they know straight away with you. How are you duck? Hey, pal. They all know that you come from uh, uh, from Stoke-on-Trent and uh, the Potteries because there isn't many towns that have got a nickname called the Potteries. We know more of the Potteries than we are at Stoke-on-Trent because this is where cups and saucers are made. Years ago the Potteries were on decline but they're fighting back. People around this area are very skillful. We might not be able to read and write, but the jobs that we do from lithography, spray, kill men, we're all skilled. You know, uh, you don't have to go uh, to college to learn. It's learning on the pottery industry, how to do all the different jobs. Uh, I've got a friend named Bill, and his mother and dad worked here, and every uh, time he could get off school and Saturdays mornings, he used to come and sit and watch his mum and dad work. And then when he was ready to finish work at school, a job come up and he said, oh, oh, Bill knows how to do that. No, he don't. But he's learned him. I did the same with my own son. I brought him here on Sunday morning, learned him how to knock. And when he come for the interview, he passed it. That's how jobs used to be given to people years ago. Now we've got to have apprentices to learn then, but in the olden days that's how we used to do it. I went to college first and I had to do 10 weeks work experience and uh, I come during my holidays and I worked the 10 weeks and, uh, and then I did that good, they offered the job to me for apprentice. It's still like stepping up to the plate, uh, Apprentice of the Year. They do a load of awards for everybody around the factory and uh, I got nominated for Apprentice of the Year and I won it. Steel Art have done well in the past year, the orders are getting higher and higher and just proves how good it is in the pottery industry.
Beautiful design. Well packed. Steel art. Top quality local product. <laughs> Come on. You love it really, don't you? <laughs> Initially, this is what my dad was planning for the last six years, but obviously due to his ill health. Uh, he never got to live this dream, so obviously I'm living this dream for him, but the technical side has, has basically been mapped out already. So I pretty much picked up the pieces, uh, dusted them off, reorganised it, and, uh, and, and got, got to where we are now. You know, for that little shop compared to this, to be running at maximum capacity, you know, on a Saturday and Sunday morning, your queue going down the high street, uh, you know, and you, you try and rush around, get everything else done as well. It was just chaos, but now this will just relax and that shop will become a, a, a real focal point of the high street now. Uh, and that they have, I haven't got a mum and a dad, so, uh, you know, something like this, this is really all, all I've got for, look, uh, all I've got to look forward to, if you get me. Because I'm, other than that, I haven't really got anything in life. So this is, this is my dream and this is what I want to do. This is why I take the risk. Because uh, you only live once. I think, I think I, he'd be happy. And I think he'd be uh, over at moon, really. It's, it's, it's something he always wanted to do, but he just, you know, like I say, with his health and everything, he, he, it's that dream he couldn't manage to just get that last little bit. But obviously, you know, if he was here now, he'd be flying the flag. And I feel honoured to fly the flag for the people of Staffordshire and South Cheshire that, that love the oatcakes and love love the area. And I'm proud to be putting Staffordshire on the map and, and uh, fighting the corner. Are you proud to come from Stoke-on-Trent? Nice. Yes, because like they help out with everything and they helped out with the Dixie during the time. I'm going to tell you a story which will make you realise how proud you should be. It starts in the Czech Republic in the Dixie. About 500 men, women and children live there. Does anybody know who this is? I don't know. Does anybody know who this is? Megan. Hi. Drew. Yeah. His name's Heidrich and he was a really, really nasty man because he killed many people for no reason. He was also second in command for Hitler. The British Army couldn't let any more people die, so they planned to get him assassinated. When Hitler found out Heidrich was killed, he was furious. Hitler blamed it on the town of Luditze and got his revenge. He said Luditze shall die. On the 10th of June, 1942, the Nazis surrounded Luditze and let nobody escape. His troops lined up the men in rows of ten and shot them. Then he picked all the children with blonde hair and blue eyes and let them live. The other children were taken to a sealed room and gassed. So, everyone stand up. The children who, have, who don't have blonde hair sit down. Anyone who doesn't have blue eyes sit down. Everyone else who's sitting down, you would have died if you were living in Luditze then. All of you standing up, you would have gone to Germany and you would have lived. When the Polish-born Dr. Barnick Strauss heard about Luditze, he decided that it couldn't go on any longer. That was when he made the campaign, Luditze shall live. In 1947, Stoke raised enough money and they built the world's largest rose garden and it was built in memory of the last lives. The town was also rebuilt and Luditze was born again. When the village was destroyed, the only thing left was a pear tree and it's now protected by the Czech Republic government. Broken. War led to devastation and nothing left in northern nation, none to be seen except a lonely pear tree there. No people deserved death, deserved death. Stoke on Trent lost their breath. Barnett Strauss wanted change. He decided to run a campaign. Miners raised money for some plants gave people another chance. Why don't you plant a, a tree, a pear? It will remind you of Luditzi over there. All I see is ruin. We should be forgiven. Why did Hitler destroy our town? 
taking people and putting them down. People should be helping, not setting crime. Why is Hitler lying while his bombers are flying and while people are dying? People should be helping to rebuild our lovely caring world. Prepare to be alone when you've got no friends. All around him is destruction and death. All that's left is the growing grass, swaying in the breeze, crying alone. Different lands all heard about this destruction, and a special man who was born at trust came over and gave birth to Aditi again. So there's a big, whatever you do, wherever you are in the world, something grows, no matter what kind of environment it is. So think about the different environments there. You know, there's the harsh desert, there's, there's the harsh tundra of the ice caps, but things still grow there. Also plants, they're required because what? Trees give us oxygen. Ah, you see. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they feed on carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, yeah. We breathe carbon dioxide out to feed the trees. They breathe it in to feed us oxygen. So we, we are what's called a symbiotic relationship. We are we are reliant upon the trees just as the trees are reliant upon us. So you see, should we share them? Ideas. I don't know what to do, so I have a chat with you. Working together, we have an idea. It helps to make things so clear. So when you think you know how to do it, sharing ideas helps you through it. New ideas, exciting joy, not just for, from adults, but girls and boys, make life better for everyone. Instead of fighting really hard to get investment coming into Stoke when really there's not much demand, you know, you could get to the position where there is demand to actually invest in Stoke-on-Trent because they see Stoke-on-Trent as a place to be associated with. You know, it's a good place to be associated with because it's done very, very proud things in the past. So that's what we try and get over to the children, that it's a very proud place, it's a very good place, and they should be very proud of themselves. And the thing about the pear tree is that very much it's a, it's a symbol of rebirth, you know. And um, I think if we can get a pear tree into every school in Stoke-on-Trent, it, so it takes a bit of the pressure off in terms of the work we do, because by getting that pear tree in, it's giving those children and the teachers a permanent reminder of what their ancestors did. They can nurture it, they can grow it, they can feed it, and so on and so forth. But also, it's, uh, it's sending out a message that the city itself is regenerating itself. Uh, Stoke-on-Trent and North Staffordshire in general gets a very hard time in the press and in the media. Uh, it's one of those places that's very often run down. And obviously children pick up on that. Uh, and one of the first things they do, generally, is when they get old enough, they sort of think about where they're going to live, where they can move to other than staying in Stoke-on-Trent. So uh, if we can go out into the schools and tell them about what their ancestors did, um, the fact that Stoke-on-Trent led the way, it actually it drove the campaign forward to rebuild the village of Liditsey. You know, it wasn't Liverpool or Glasgow or London. It was the city of Stoke-on-Trent that actually led the way. You know, and if you can go out into the schools and tell the children that, all of a sudden their view about their hometown the home city changes dramatically. I think what needs to happen within Stoke-on-Trent is things need to be broken down more. So there needs to be uh, civic awareness and um, a level of understanding of heritage and pride at a very um, local level. So within Fenton, for instance, or within Burton or Burslem or Tunstall or Stoke-upon-Trent, you know, People need to feel very proud of their own little enclave, you know. Uh, and I think if there's pride and regeneration with each, within each uh, town or village uh, that derives from that pride, then I think that drives the whole city forward. Okay, okay, okay.